Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We're broadcasting throughout the United Kingdom and around the world on all our digital platforms, bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 to 8, broadcasting on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and TikTok. And thanks to all the folk who are coming in. And we've got a packed program tonight for the next hour because there's been a lot happening, if you hadn't noticed, in the world and also in the United Kingdom. Who has got their census forms in this week and who has filled them out online and who has requested a paper copy Alan says, remember when war breaks out, pardon the witches. We're going to be speaking about that. We've got that scheduled down for later tonight. We're going to talk about the pardoning the witches thing because it's actually it's actually more relevant than people might imagine. Nicola Sturgeon has good reason to want to pardon witches. She has good reason to want to absolve witchcraft. She has good reason to want to rehabilitate sorcery. And we'll be getting to that later on in the program. So it's not disconnected. It's a connected thing to exactly what's happening at the moment. Because remember, there's people pushing these agendas. And so you have to say, why why now are they going to pardon witches? What's happening right now that might make it make it feasible that some people don't want witchcraft to be thought of as a bad thing? You know, you have to be always thinking about that. And we're going to be getting into that in a little bit more depth, doing a little bit more of that later on in the program. But right now, what's happening with the census? Well, I received my, my uh, here it is, Scotland's census. Okay. Shaping our future. Now, you know, when you see these, these modern terms, you know, you're like, oh no, do we have to shape our future? Really? Do I want to be shaping my future with the people who are running Hollywood? Is that going to work out well? So straight away, you're like, oh no, oh no, do I have to? And then it's, it goes furthermore, take part to help shape Scotland's future. And you just know it's not going to be shaped in a way that s people like ourselves are necessarily going to want. Let's hope that it is, but you just know that's not. It's, you just know they're going to mess it up in some way. It's like going to be, it's going to be like back to the future or something. And so what they also say in there is that, and oh, here's an advert as well that appeared, I noticed in uh in uh, the Scotland on Sunday. I can fill it in on paper. That's handy. Well, it is handy because I, I requested a paper version and you can do that by using the number that they've given you. You go into the website, the census website, which the address is on that piece of paper. Uh, you fill in your number and then you just request a paper copy and they've already got your details, you know, in there and so they just fire it off to you. And I prefer a paper copy because I like to work and see it all in front of me so I can like flip it all over and say, oh, how is this all connected? Because when you're doing it online, you don't necessarily get that sense of connection to the overall document. You're just confronted with one page at a time. So I my brain works better when I have to fill it in online and it, it, you just, it just feels more comprehensive and it feels safer. It's like they're not going to catch you out and then you're like, oh no, how did I do that and how do I go back to the previous page to change my answer and all that kind of stuff. So I prefer to do it on paper, but that's just, that's just me. And then it says, filling in the census helps us find out what your community really needs and, um, well, what it needs as according to them. Scotland's census, getting the right things out starts with filling it in. And there they go again, getting the right things out. Uh-oh, you just know, you just know that's going to be problematical. But I'm going to fill it in. I'm not going to, I'm not one of these people that's going to boycott it because it's, because it's, uh, because it's an SNP thing. 
Um, we're going to fill it in and uh, just hope for the best, really. Um, PBC says, yeah, that PBC requested a paper version for the same reason. And Adam's not a fan of the census. He says he'd rather wipe his rear end with it and flush it down the toilet. Okay. We know where you stand on that one. That's quite... <laughs> a fair comment, you know. Steve says it asked too many questions. Yeah, that's a good good point. It's like, how many questions do you need to know? Really? I mean... <sighs> I don't really know how many questions they need to know at all. But what some, something that's quite interesting, we'll put, we'll put it up there, is that there's a question on your national identity. What do you feel is your national identity? Scottish, English, Northern Irish, Welsh, British. Other, please write it in. And... Um, that's interesting. Many of us will... will uh, so you can tick if you want. If you want, you can tick Scottish and British. Or some people might just want to tick British or whatever. So that's, that's interesting that they've got that. But then they have, a, they have another one, which is your... Now, and this is something that I didn't know they even allowed anymore. But they ask, what do you think is your ethnic identity as a white person? And they put that one up. And um, because I thought all of that ethnic thing was like just for the Ukrainians and the Russians to bother about. But apparently um, there it's also here in Britain. So there's that that census um, pick is there also just beside the national one. And I'll just read that out when we get it up there. Um, so choose one section from A to F, then tick one box, one box which best describes your ethnic group or background. Well, and this is for white people. Scottish, and this is the one that's been causing confusion, other British, by which they presume they mean English, Welsh and Northern Irish. Why they didn't just put a box in there for that? And why they don't have a specific box for British ethnic identity, which is, I would imagine, a, what a lot of people would actually call themselves. Because the British, uh, the Scottish, if you if you call them the Scottish, English, Northern Irish and Welsh, then they're very much intermixed ethnically. So you would tend to think of your ethnic identity often as British rather than as other British. So that's... But if you just think it's British alone, then you can actually write that in at the bottom. But look at the bottom there. There's a strange one. Show man and show woman. And, um, okay, let's get rid of that now. What what does that mean? Well, apparently, and let me just bring this up because I, I had to Google this to, to check what was meant by that. But this is um, people, apparently, who regard themselves as uh, united by the fairground industry. And according to the BBC report, they don't consider themselves an ethnic group, but a cultural one. So why they are under the ethnic box, I don't know. But what I thought was amazing was that they've managed, the, the guys that, that run the fairgrounds, right, you know, the blokes that go, oh, that's uh, a pound, mate. And when you sit in that, make sure to uh, put your seatbelt on while I chat to my girlfriend here with a fag in my hand and then press this button that propels you into space at 120 miles an hour. They're, um, they regard themselves as so culturally distinct as to have lobbied successfully for a bit on the census, which seems odd. I don't know. But they've been more successful at doing that than the British ethnic group <laughs> has been successful in getting a separate box for British ethnic group. So that's uh, that's by the by. But uh, interesting, interesting stuff. So that's the... the, the um, that's the census there. And when 
when I get the actual paper copy in, I'll have a lot more to say about it. So that might be next week or the week thereafter. Well, it has to be next week, doesn't it? Because they say it's Monday the 20th that it has to be done. That has to be done by, yeah, everybody does it on Monday the 20th. Yes, other British sounds insulting. It sounds demeaning, you know, just other British, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thomas says he's boycotting it and no point in filling any form that the SNP will de de the SNP will deny my views like they have since 2014 yeah yeah and then when you fill it in they'll say oh you've got to fill it in again okay the census we don't like the result of the census so everybody's got to fill in the census again until we get the result that we want that's probably like what will happen Rita says that she's going to write in the box there, British, because she won't be completing it online. Pauline says, right, we're waiting on the paper copy, so I will be British on it in big letters. And Paul says, why not have witches on the census? That would, yeah, I mean, there's a growing number of them, apparently, in Scotland. And um, they're being, um, they're being encouraged by the, the Scottish National Party that no longer think apparently witchcraft is just some sort of um, figment of the, 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 the 1500s imagination. Um, so they maybe could, or maybe it was going to become more of a real thing, uh, in which case, yeah. And Kevin says, may as well have Anglo-Danish for Northern England. And Northumberland. Yeah, yeah. He says, the island I live on is Britain, so I am British. And Mark says, we are all British. I like to think that. I like to think that. Um, Ernest says, thank you for fighting for the welfare and prosperity of Scotland. Thanks. It's an endless task, and many of us are engaged in it. Successfully, I should say. But it's not one that ever finishes. It's one that just keeps on going. And PBC there makes a good point about doing it on, uh, completing it on paper, that it's actually recorded that way. And it's it, while it's easier to delete data from an online version, paper actually leaves a trail. And that's absolutely correct, isn't it? Yeah, and that's the big worry about data now, is it can just be so manipulated it's frightening and even even um videos can be manipulated and faces can be put on to another face and voices can be copied almost exactly to make it look in the future that people in the past said or did things that they never did we don't look like that at all that sort of i mean that is like modern witchcraft that is like modern sorcery because you're putting upon somebody an idea or a thought that they never actually said or did and down through time that could really confuse the matter so that that's a, and that's the sort of thing that the witches in the past used to do as well it's like you know they would create little effigies of people and pretend it was them and then you know whatever stick pins in them I've got a bit of that I'm going to read actually from a book in a minute um Right, so that's the census thing. That's the census. Now, talking about the witches, right, what's going on here? Well, apparently yesterday was International Women's Day and Nicola Sturgeon took the opportunity to to pardon, in her view, no, not to pardon, to give an apology for the um, people who had been accused of being witches who were killed in Scotland during the 1500s, 1600s and early 1700s. Of course, during that period, lots of people were being killed for all sorts of things, especially religious disagreements with each other and even um, within their own religious groups. Of course, I mean, it was a, it was a seriously uh, bloody time in Scotland and, of course, throughout the British Isles and witches were... Uh, people who are called witches, you know, were 
in all of that as well because everything was religion. Everything was religion and witches were thought to be siding with Satan. And in that regard, I've been reading this book from, uh, it's called King James VI and i I'm still getting through it. It's, it's, it was written like in the 50s and it's like lots of words close together. So it takes a while to, to read it, but it's got some interesting points about King James because he got a lot of stick as well for um, having a go at witches and many witches died under his authority. And the question is, well, how did he see these things, really? You know, how did how did all that come about? And... It's talk, talking about here, throughout the winter of 1590 to 1591, there had been in the Lothians a number of witch trials, and in them, partly because of his taste for the abnormal, James had taken a fascinated interest. A witch named Julie Duncan, who confessed to have danced and played upon a trumpet before other witches in the Kirkyard at North Berwick, was brought before James to repeat her antics, and another witch, Agnes Sampson, whispered to him things he had said to his queen on their wedding night. So on and so forth. And this spooked him seriously. And it goes on, it says, he was interested also because he regarded witchcraft as a branch of theology. And that's an important thing to understand when you're trying to figure out how all this happened in Scotland, is it was seen as very much part of the overall uh, religious um matter of the day. Witches and sorcerers, he believed, were persons of abandoned morals who had been lured by Satan to repudiate God and to yield themselves wholly to the guidance of the devil. And there were more witches than sorcerers, said James, because women are more frail than men and because the devil, having seduced Eve in the beginning, has been, quote, the homelier with that sex ever since. Indeed, to the modern reader, perhaps the strongest impression left by James's book called Demonology is its vivid portrayal of the intense reality of Satan. And at that time, there was a fellow called the Earl of Bothwell who really had it in for James and who wanted essentially to kill him. And the Earl of Bothwell was involved with what was essentially a coven of what were called witches who were literally in their in their way casting casting spells as they saw it against him including casting cats bound to the severed joints of dead bodies into the sea they had sought to raise storms while the king was on his voyage to denmark and they did other things here, which I'm not going to read out. And they got they weren't they got sent to trial. And uh, the point is that it says here James has been accused of sadistic pleasure in inflicting pain, but this is unjust. Fear is a potent cause of cruelty, and James was in great terror. Moreover, when he hated, he hated with vindictive intensity, and he regarded witchcraft with its repudiation of God as the vilest of sins, the highest point of idolatry wherein no exception is admitted by the law of God. So back in those days, it was all really intense religious stuff. And if you were accused of being a witch, often perhaps wrongly, but sometimes with uh, degree of uh, you know justification then you're in big trouble I mean you were in big big trouble it says later in England his views became more moderate that was when he became James the, the, the sixth of Great Britain his views became more moderate bordering on scepticism and he mitigated the ferocity of the English trials he did not do so in Scotland, and his one defence must be that he was in great terror and was utterly sincere. And that's, that's the thing 
about it is that he was utterly sincere about it. And the people who didn't like witches, they were utterly sincere about it as well. And so it was, a, it was something that these days we would struggle to, to, to grasp and, and to feel the emotional intensity of. But clearly, back in those days, it was a real thing. And people really did believe that the, the spells could, um, could cause death and destruction. And so it's within that context that we should sort of understand, understand it. And of course, many innocent women would, of course, be caught up in that um, emotion and the violence of that emotion. But at the same time, a lot, it, a lot of it was also sincere, uh, sincere fear and sincere terror. And there were people who did practice strange arts like that as well. So all of that gets thrown in. So why is why is Nicholas Sturgeon bringing all that up at the, at this moment? And um, it's a it's a very good question. And I have my own particular theory about this, which is that there's a lot of what we might call modern sorcery going on at the moment. And it seems to be as if it's just normal, but it's not really. It's like the, the Gender Recognition Act, for example, where a man can say that he's a woman and a woman can say that she's a man. Now, that in the old days would have immediately been considered like sorcery like witches changing men into women and women into men. And so what we've got with that gender thing is a modern day form of sorcery, in, which would have been understood in the, in the past as sorcery, as magic. Um, but today we're just meant not to think of it, obviously, in those sorts of terms. So, you know, if you... If you're promoting that fantasy, if you're promoting that sham, which in the old days would have been considered to be witchcraft, then today you want to ensure that witchcraft is not considered a bad thing. You want to pardon the witches so-called of the past. You want to give the impression that witchcraft in the past uh, was actually okay and that it was somehow just a, a mistake. So, you know, she wants to she wants to promote a form of modern sorcery, which is the whole men and women changing changing the nature of the reality and into something that's unnatural. Um if you want to promote that idea, then you have to consider you have to promote the idea that it's not wrong and that it was never wrong. And in the past, it was never wrong. So you have to do things like uh, say that uh, that witchcraft and and other things like that are in fact kosher. So, so what you're looking at is her basically trying to absolve that concept of sorcery, witchcraft in the past. She wants to absolve it from sin and indeed rehabilitate it. And we see a lot of that actually in the modern in modern programs as well, like on Netflix and so on. There's a lot of programs that just promote that strange, that strange um, sorcery. In fact, there's one called The Witcher, which is a big on Netflix, and um, and that's everywhere. That's everywhere these days. I was, I was walking down Argyle Street, and this is at Christmas time, right? This is about a week before Christmas, and in Argyle Street, there's a massive building, which is abandoned, and Netflix has obviously bought the rights to advertise on it, and every so often they'll drape a massive banner over it, and this is several stories high, and uh, lots, uh, you know, about fifty yards across. And it will be advertising films or series that are on Netflix. And down below it, in the middle of Argyle Street, they will have some sort of um, a presentation that's there uh, 24 hours a day to, to represent whatever the film is. And at Christmas time, they were advertising The Witcher. And down below, they had this... Uh, kind of snow cone, what do you call it, like a snow cone thing, like you, you know, go in to get your picture taken. And it was this horrible, grotesque monster from the Witcher series. And um, this was at Christmas time, right? That was the only thing 
out there. So I thought, goodness me, goodness me, you know, we're totally benighted. And then what happens, what then comes up is like Nicholas Sturgeon starts saying, oh, witchcraft in the past, it was all just a misunderstanding and um, nothing wrong with it. And we can all just play about with that. And um, so that's what's going on. So, you know, there is there is an agenda behind behind her pardoning witches. I could go deeper, but I'm not going to go deeper. But I've been reading, and I must be getting highly influenced by his book, Demonology. That was James VI who wrote that. Which is fascinating, actually. I've got both versions. I've got it in Old Scots and in Modern English. Um, so, where are we? It's bottom of the hour already, so I'm going to go on to On This Day in British History. On This Day in British History. This was actually the day after the very first referendum in the United Kingdom. And that very first referendum was on the 8th of March, 1973. And it was asking the people of Northern Ireland if they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom. And that was the first ever referendum that's been held in the British Isles in Northern Ireland in 1973. And... So today was the result of that, and indeed 98.9% of the people who voted, voted to stay in the United Kingdom. And the reason it was so high was because the referendum was actually boycotted by the, the Irish nationalist and Republican element who didn't want to get involved with it. But <clears throat> nevertheless, it happened. And from our perspective today, what's very interesting is the questions that were asked. Now, if you take your mind back to 2014, we were asked, and indeed, what was the actual exact question that we were asked? We've got the ballot paper there. I'll just put that up. The the ballot paper for the Scottish referendum in, in 2014. It was just a very simple question. Should Scotland be an independent country? Yes, no. Now, that's very interesting. I just wanted to, to talk a couple of minutes about that. Notice the United Kingdom is not mentioned there at all. Okay? It's not mentioned. So we don't know. It's be an independent country from what? It's not should Scotland break away from the United Kingdom or should Scotland leave the United Kingdom or anything like that. And then it's just a yes or no. Two very emotive answers. And also, yes is above no, even though yes comes after N in the alphabet. The question, however, in um, Northern Ireland was, do you want Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom? Or do you want Northern Ireland to be joined with the Republic of Ireland? outside the United Kingdom and you simply ticked one or the other with a cross and that that's those are far more neutral questions do you want Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom or do you want Northern Ireland to be joined with the Republic of Ireland so much more neutral question from what we got which and it also mentions the United Kingdom as well it mentions the United Kingdom, which our one in 2014 didn't do. So getting the ballot paper right in future is a big, a big thing. If such a if such a referendum were ever to happen again, we cannot be going into it with yes, no. It has to, it has to be a neutrally phrased question, not an emotively phrased question. Um, and I'll tell you something else that not many people know, but I knew it because. A force for good. We appointed forty-two counting agents throughout the United, throughout Scotland that night, and I was at the count. And if we bring up the the Scottish ballot paper again, what quite a lot of people did, like scores of people, would not put a tick or a cross, but rather in the yes box they would put yes. Or in the no box, they would actually write no. And so all those ballots went to adjudication. 
which meant that the counting agents such as myself, we had to stand around and look at it. And the, count, the, the returning officers were working from a book that told them what to do in certain situations. And if you put a yes in the yes box, that was counted as a vote for yes. But here's the thing. If you put a no in the no box, that was counted as a double negative, which means that the vote was discarded. And in Glasgow alone, there was something like 20 or 30 of those. And these were all just discarded. But the 20 or 30 yes votes, they were all counted. And each time that happened, myself and another counting agent, we said that this, we're, we're, we're registering a disagreement with that, you know, because that's a no vote. That's somebody writing that in there for no. But these, if you wrote, if you wrote no in the no box, it was discarded. But if you wrote yes in the yes box, it was counted. Total travesty. Total travesty. And but we made we we made our complaint known at the time. But the returning officers would go, no, we're working from this booklet that tells us what we have to do in that situation. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. So that was today in 19, well, it was yesterday in 1974, but the result came out today and it was uh, overwhelmingly for staying in, interestingly enough. <clears throat> Christopher says, it was way too loaded a question. Cameron should never have allowed the question to be phrased that way in the Scottish referendum. No, you're absolutely correct. It should never have happened. And in our... In our magazine here, Union Heart, do more together, which is available for uh, Fiverr. We list 102 policies to keep the United Kingdom together, and one and the one of the pages here talks specifically about about that, and we call it "Ensure breaking up is hard to do." And in that, we talk about how the, you have to get the ballot paper and the question and answer right. Because how the ballot paper is worded and how the question and answer are framed confers an advantage and determines the nature of the campaign for both sides. Utterly de determines the entire frame in which they can possibly operate. So we cannot have a yes versus no again because that puts no at the serious disadvantage. And already we've lost one or two percentage points just by having to defend the negative. And also the United Kingdom has to be mentioned prominently as well. Breaking up should be hard to do. We want to make it as difficult as possible for the people who want to destroy the United Kingdom to get their way. OK, we have to make it as difficult as possible. And we can do that democratically. Good. Now, talking about do more together, I should have said we're working on issue five, which is going to be a special collector's edition. And it's looking at the previous 10 years of A Force for Good, because on the 21st of March will be our 10th birthday. We were established in 2012. And I took the last 10 days to write the magazine. That's why there wasn't a broadcast last week. We were busy putting together this 20-page magazine, which looks at every single year that we've been in operation and looks at some of the highlights in every single year per page. And there's two pages for 2019, two pages for 2020, and two pages for 2021. There's also a page which details all the breakdowns of all the Scottish Nationalist marches that we've been at and that we've counted. And there's also a page which looks at the next five to ten years and what's likely to happen and how we see our role at A Force for Good in continuing to keep the British end up. 
and then there's several other pages there as well of interest and that's going to be launched at our 10 year AFFG celebration which is going to be in the center of Glasgow on Saturday the 19th of March and if you're a donor if you're a monthly supporter or a donor or if you've ever stood with us on the street in any way then you are invited and if you have not received an invite and we don't have emails for everybody and if you've not received an, e uh, an email invite please do contact us at contact at a force for good uk and we will send you the official invite and we will send you the details of where it's going to be okay it's going to be a good day and i was speaking to the person this morning and finalizing it all and i also spoke to a baker who's baking us a couple of cakes as well and that was really, really good because uh, I phoned up the baker and said, can you do red, white and blue sponge? And they said, no problem. And then he goes, would you like red, white and blue trim around it and all that sort of stuff? And I was like, absolutely, mate. Thanks. Thanks. So going to be a good day. So if you're if, if you're an activist, ever been an activist with us, just standing with us, contact us. And if you've even donated anything from two pounds to a hundred pounds contact us and if you're a monthly donor as well please contact us as i say we don't have the email addresses for everybody who is a donor so please if you'd like to be there contact me and i'll get the information to you at that address contact at a force for good uk already got a lot of people there already got a lot of people so just but we do have room for a few more excellent excellent stuff excellent stuff yeah so what else has been happening what else has been happening this week let me see what's the yeah going back to the ballot thing yeah salmon set the question that should never have been allowed says Stephen. and patrick gets it right he says the nationalists want to break up the uk because of their hatred towards england even if that means they would go through extreme hardship these people live in a different world where Money grows off trees and the lochs are full of whiskey. And Cameron did absolutely underestimate the danger because we say that in the very, in the second paragraph of our, our magazine, uh, the is issue five that's coming up, uh, how when he said that on the Andrew Marr show, when he said that he was going to give a referendum to the SNP, People like ourselves were totally shocked because we knew that we were not ready. We, the pro-UK people were not organised, were not prepared, were not networked. We did not even know who we were. We did not even know other people. We certainly did not know other people who would be prepared to do anything. Whereas, of course, the SNP had an actual organisation, an actual party that was networked for that specific task so it was a big frightener that we got when he did that and uh, I mean we as an organization really didn't find our feet until about 2016 and we, I run through all of that I run through all of that with um, with the new magazine which is a really good uh, history piece it, it will go to everybody who attends our birthday bash they'll get a copy free and all the union supporters who have requested it, that is, the people who are part of our monthly donor program. So if you'd like to be that, we've got a graphic there that will flash up for union supporters as well. Please do donate. Yeah, Kathleen, we're going to see you there. Good, good. And please do come, everyone. Now, we've got a, a wee fundraising thing that we're doing because for our party now we know that not everybody will be able to be there but we know that a lot of people will wish as well so if you'd like to donate 10 pounds for the next 10 years you've we've got uh, a link that uh on our website for that and um we'll just put up the link there the 10 for 10 link 
We'll put that up in the comments on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, click on that, and you can just donate ten pounds, just like a just just like a wish you well guys kind of donation, and that'll actually allow you to get an invite as well if you want, because then you'll be a donor to a force for good. What else has been happening this week? Here's an interesting one. The Bank of... You know, in our magazine, Do More Together, we've pointed out... We've pointed out that the British Central Bank is misnamed. OK, it's not the Bank of England. It's the British Central Bank because it was nationalised as the British Central Bank in 1946. But what happened was that the the Labour Party at the time didn't it just it didn't have any sort of a concept of 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 keeping the United Kingdom together as a United Kingdom as such. So it didn't see the the uh, anomaly of the British Central Bank being called the Bank of England because prior to that it had actually been a private bank. So. We've been pointing out that it really needs to, uh, it needs a little bit of a rebranding, as it were. And we pointed this out in our magazine, It's the British Central Bank. And lo and behold, a colleague yesterday pointed out to us that the the Bank of England has, has changed its logo. Um, it hasn't changed its name, of course. It's still the Bank of England, but it's changed its logo to a British logo. Now we'll put up the, we'll put up the, the change there. There's there's a graphic that went out from the Bank of England. We've made our Britannia symbol more inclusive, and our logo and website have a new look. So that was the the old Britannia was actually her sitting for some reason beside an English flag shield. Uh, and they've changed that now to her sitting beside a Union Jack shield. So I guess that's what they mean by more inclusive. I suppose they're meaning more inclusive of the United Kingdom as such. Uh, so I'm very much all for that. I'm all very much all for that change, which is quite a dramatic change when you think about it. Because for, I guess, hundreds of years, it's had... Britannia sitting beside us, uh, the English flag, and now she's sitting beside the British flag. So that's an interesting change that they've made. Okay, it does leave a slight anomaly, of course, in that she's sitting beside the British flag and it's still called the Bank of England. So maybe that'll be the next thing on the, uh, the agenda. They'll change it to the British Central Bank, which I would actually be quite pleased to see. I know some people are romantically attached to its old name, but we, we looked at that. We looked at that in our magazine there, and we made the case that, in fact, uh, there's plenty of reasons why it needs to change, especially because it does add total confusion to the currency debate because so many people in Scotland, even well-meaning people, imagine that the Bank of Scotland, for example, is a national bank. It's not a national bank. It's a private bank. It cannot create money. It has to borrow its money from the British Central Bank, which is misnamed the Bank of England. So then people will say, well, why does Scotland have to borrow from England? Which is an understandable confusion because it's not actually borrowing from the Bank of England. It's actually borrowing from the British bank, the British central bank. But because it's called the Bank of England, people think that we're relying on England. No, we're not. We're not relying on England. We're relying on the British bank, the British central bank. And so when you don't have the right names for something, it really does confuse the issue. And it, it totally confused the currency issue in 2014. I remember that. I remember saying to people, no, we're not borrowing from England. It's not the English bank. It's actually the British bank. And they'd say, well, why is it called the Bank of England then? And I'd be like, yeah, good point. Nothing I can do about it yet except complain. So, so maybe, so, you know, we've been seeing, we've been seeing moves that are made as a consequence of stuff that we've been pushing out. And so we'd like to think that we have had 
an influence in some ways. And of course, we're not going to get any credit for that. And that's fine. We're not asking for any credit. We just want to see the changes being made. No British king or queen on Scottish and Irish banknotes. Why? Well, that's a good point, Steve. And I've wondered about that myself because um, the closest you will come is a Robert the Bruce. Well, I, I guess I guess one of the reasons is because the the Bank of England has the Queen on it, but it's really the British central bank having the head of state of Britain on it, as it should. But all the banks in Scotland are private banks, and what they have to do if they want, like, to print off a thousand five-pound notes. What they have to do is give £5,000 to the British Central Bank. And the British Central Bank will then say, you now have authority to print off £1,005 notes that you can brand whatever way you want. And it's interesting that the Scottish private banks have not branded, to my knowledge, their notes with the certainly the current monarch or even any former prime ministers the closest we would come would be the Robert the Bruce picture on one of the the banknotes that would be the closest they come but it's a good point good point Paul says send the Bank of England a message of support for their rebrand if you can tell us if you um, Paul if you can put up the Bank of England email address for us to contact put that up in the comments please and i'll read it out and we can um send them send them a message just to say nice rebrand nice to see the union jack there you go nelson i agree with you he wants the british central bank to be called the british central bank another thing that we wanted and what we what we talked about here is that every banknote, every banknote, whether private banks or whether the British Central Bank note, should have a wee imprint on it, a wee imprint on it which says, this note is British sterling, backed by the British Central Bank. So that, and what that would do is it would create, it would, it would stop the Scottish nationalists complaining. Like when they go to Hartlepool and they buy a fish supper for, with a 50 quid bank uh, Clydesdale banknote and they get turned down it would stop them complaining because they could then say well it is legal currency because read it see what it says it says this note is British sterling which is backed by the British Central Bank so it would help it would help people throughout the United Kingdom to understand that all the currency that circulates all the cash that circulates it's all British Central Bank created all right. Now, remember, folks, that if you're a donor or a, an activist, do contact us if you haven't received an invite to our 10th birthday bash, which is on Saturday afternoon on the 19th. Contact us at aforceforgood.uk. That's where we are to be found. And when we get your information, we will get you we will get that um, the, the details straight off to you. So it's the top of the hour, folks. We will be back next Wednesday. We didn't have time this week for a busting indie myths, but we'll have a busting indie myths next week. And so it, we'll see you then. Usual time, seven o'clock. It just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom and. God save the Queen. See you next week. And goodbye to everybody on TikTok. We'll see you next week, folks. Thanks very much for your engagement.